So now we're going to go into a new bucket, Ryan, and we're going to yep. go to uh, a game that you and I and Vince Horn have had a lot of fun in. Mm -hmm. Battlefield 5. Yep. And uh, here I'm focusing not on the single player campaign, but on multiplayer. Yeah. Particularly on the team oriented multiplayers like Capture the Flag, uh, etc. Yeah, this game out of games uh, similar to it really does emphasize the team play given that the, there's different roles that you can play, you know, like uh, medic or uh, scout, you know, um, you just have specifically different roles and you really, it, it's hard to play the game if you try to be a, a red solo person. It's just, yep. you have to play as a team. Exactly. You can, but your team will lose. Your team will lose. Yeah, like, so you, you're forced to play it. It's, even though if you're, you know, you're firing guns and things like that, you gotta play as a team. It's really cool. It's a really cool mechanic. Yeah. No, it, it really is. And you need like actual communication and strategy and, and all of that. Um, and in fact, in fact, I mean, get rid of sort of the cognitive aspects of Amber, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, not even necessarily thinking or communicating or all that. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the best way to win this game is to simply follow everybody else wherever they're going. So there's sort of a yes. mentality. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm going with you guys. And as long as I stay closer to you guys, we have a better chance of winning. I'm not yep. even thinking about strategy. Yeah, because there's other games like this where like sometimes you can, you know, if you're a quote Billy Badass, you could just kind of run and gun and, and lift your team up. Um, but this one is just like, mm, yeah, there probably is true. Like, I know there's going to be people who are just amazing, but a lot of times it's just like follow the pack. <laughs> right. Which is true in any war. You, I mean, you have genuine war heroes, and then you have everyone else who's, yep. you know, actually doing 99% of the fighting. So this was a great game to start with because this is strong amber content, strong amber theme, strong amber game. Yeah, and the, and the scoring, too, is not just like a lot of games like these. You know, the score is just only, like, how many kills there are. But with this one, you have different points for doing different things, like helping the team out. Yep, yep you get points for uh, for, for healing uh you, you can actually you can actually rank fairly high in this game without ever fighting without ever without no ever killing anybody yeah yep um so yeah so a great example of of amber very similar to this game another game we've spent numerous hours playing um but actually shows a little again shows why these three categories are so important is uh destiny 2 multiplayer so i mean almost the same exact uh, dynamics destiny as battlefield 2. yeah seriously right the only difference between this and Battlefield is the content. It's got orange science fiction content instead of mm. amber military World War II content. This for me is still the best. Destiny 2. It's it's one of the most balanced shooters. I mean, no, no, Destiny. This is Destiny 2. No, Destiny, the first Destiny is the, my favorite. Yeah. Oh, is it really? Because yeah, this is the current one, Destiny 2, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, the, the first one was just level up. Interesting. Because they went back. I didn't know you felt that way. Yeah, but it's still great. They're amazing. Well, it's got some of the best gunplay of any of these. Mechanics are, are one of the best. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, by the way, just to go back to Wolfenstein, that's one of the things I really loved about Wolfenstein was that the gunplay just felt, it felt heavy. It felt weighty. You could feel the impact of every shot. Um, it just, it felt good. And there's certain yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Feel it just feels good. This feels good. And, you know, and one thing here too, one last thing to say, like what's what's different about these games versus some of the other red games where you're just firing guns. With these kind of games, usually, I mean, it's just always beneficial to talk with people, like with your team. You're always going to do better. Like it's always, if you see on the screen, you're with three random people and then the other team all have the same gamer tags. You're just like, this is going to suck because they're all communicating and coordinating. So it emphasizes... Uh, and us, but only us. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So now let's move to another kind of amber game. Uh, this is going to be a game that's more uh, amber content and even amber themes, uh, but has orange gameplay. And that is another one of my favorites, a game called Crusader Kings 3. This just came out last year. Uh, it's one of the best games of the year, if not the best, honestly. And this game is basically, um, it's a feudalism simulator <laughs> slash story generator. Uh, it takes mm. place between the 9th century and the 15th century. Um, you get to learn really cool terms like, you know, uh, you know, here's one of them. Uh, agnatic cognatic primogeniture. Ooh. Who knows what that is? Sounds Dutchy. dirty. <laughs> it does kind of sound kind of dirty. <laughs> that just I means women are allowed to take the throne only after all male inheritors have died. Oh. That's all that means. Oh, but you get to learn cool things like that. 
Um, and at first glance, you know, this looks like a basic kind of conquest game, like a civilization game, for example, mm -hmm. which we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. but it's really not. Um, it's 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 more about the actual relationships that get mm. formed between all these different, you know, because that's what feudalism is. We, we think of like medieval history as like, you know, England went to war against France. Well, that's not actually how the feudalistic world worked. There was no real unit that people thought of as England and a unit that people thought of as France. It was more like this family, which controls these territories and has these duchies, etc., went to war mm. with this family who controls the, and as soon as, the control of those territories changes due to, you know, whatever sort of ongoing events, that war goes away. So this wasn't like nation state against nation state because that didn't really exist yet. Mm -hmm. So this was more about the intrigue and the drama and, you know, mm -hmm. marrying your your daughter off to some mm -hmm. king in some faraway country. And but you def I mean, definitely this kind of these kind of games, I mean, you just look at automatically you feel into that like sociocentric level of game of of. of way of being in game totally. uh, gaming yeah yep. it's really really obvious yeah. and it's a story general i mean this game this is one of the two games on this list today that have probably the steepest learning curve it's an intimidating the game wow. to get into because most people don't know feudal history yeah. <laughs> it's a, the game does a good job of hand of holding your hand it's got a great tutorial system and tool tips and all that it's got endless depth but the really cool thing about this game is you don't need to know any of that you can just sort of play watch it play itself out just d make the major decision points and just get a story. Um, it's a story generator more than anything. And it's, you can even execute the Pope and replace him with a cannibal. <laughs> you can turn Christianity funny. into a cannibal religion if you want to in this game. And that's, that's fun. just cool. <laughs> All right. So uh, now we're going to go again into the uh, time capsule. I'm sure everyone's going to recognize this one right away. Perfect amber game <laughs> on a perfect amber screen. <laughs> Tetris. So why did I choose Tetris for this one? Um, you know, Tetris, I think, is a perfect example of a game that is based almost entirely on concrete operational cognition. Yeah. And just to remind people, you know, concrete operational is a stage in Piaget's developmental unfolding. Uh, typically, you know, hits kids around eight years old up until about 12 years old or so. And this involves a logic of physical objects. So this is the first kind of reason, the first kind of logic that begins to come online. We learn, you know, things like proportionality. Um, we learn things like the conservation of matter that you can take, you know, uh, a, a, a wide glass of water poured into a thin glass of the kid will know it's the same amount of water so this is where a lot of you know really important logic skills come online and tetris i think just nails it you've got you know these pixels that are all made of four blocks they can fit in somewhere your goal is to stack them up in a certain way and clear i mean this is mm -hmm. this is sort of the pinnacle of concrete operations yeah. um and i love presenting it here a because every single one of us Every single one of us has spent hours on this game. <laughs> and now there's like all kinds of versions of it, but yeah. It now, that's the thing, Ryan. This game now looks like this. So, you know, I love it when games evolve. And this game has <laughs> evolved quite a bit. I have this on my Oculus Quest 2. So I play this in virtual reality. Oh, yeah. And holy Jesus, is it gorgeous and uh, in game. It's got a couple of wrinkles in there, a couple of new challenges, but it's gorgeous. I mean, look at these backgrounds, which are simultaneously and, you know, absorbing and distracting, you know? Yeah. Um, and the music is just kind of, you know, let me kind of. Right oh, yeah. It's definitely a sexier version than the old Game Boy one. <laughs> yeah, it's got this like real sleek, sexy interface, and it's you know it's it's just as addictive as the original Tetris was on my Game Boy when I was a kid. Yeah, totally. 